Hi, everybody. Welcome to our session, Labor Market Information 101. I'm Julia DeBonaventura, Senior Program Manager at JFF, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nancy Hoffman, a Senior Advisor at JFF. In this session, we will discuss and explore how to use traditional and real-time labor market information to inform pathways development, individual, student, and family decision-making, and employer partnership development. We'll start off with a bit of intro to labor market information, where, where we'll explore key terms and applications of labor market information. The session will also include, also include insight into the opportunity framework, a new way of classifying and comparing the advancement potential of middle scale work. Finally, we'll end with a discussion of important equity considerations when designing pathways aligned with labor market demands. There are a number of ways that we can use labor market information in the design and implementation of pathway programming. As a first step, we can use it to inform the industries and occupations that we build into. We want to make sure that our local economy can support an increase in individuals trained for specific industries or occupations. We can use both real-time and traditional LMI to help us think about program design. LMI tells us about in-demand credentials and preferred education levels for occupations across a career ladder. Real-time labor market information can also tell us about the competencies and skills that are of value to an industry, within an occupation, or to a specific employer. Real-time labor market information also gives us useful information about employers in our region, who they are, what their biggest needs are. It allows us to anticipate their needs as we explore partnerships and ensure that Pathways Design aligns with the workforce demands of our regional employer community. LMI can also be used to better understand the demographics of an occupation or industry, including information about age, race and ethnicity, and gender. For many of you who are developing or have developed career pathway maps or program of study maps, we know you're thinking about how to use LMI to inform student and family decision making. Young people have many decisions to make around which pathway to choose to pursue, what credentials to pursue, and inform their decisions around job searches and entry level employment. There are two primary categories or types of labor market information traditional data and real-time data. Traditional data is produced by public agencies such as the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It includes past trends and future projections on hundreds of standardized industries and occupations. Traditional data is information that has been collected for decades and is based on either mandatory tax records or mandatory employer participation in surveys. This kind of information is generally more accurate and complete than real-time data, but not as timely. Real-time labor market information, on the other hand, is collected using proprietary software like Burning Glass, which crawls or spiders online job ads and a database of, res of resumes. It's more timely than traditional data, but sometimes it's incomplete. Oftentimes it's incomplete. It's only as good as the data available on our online job ads. Labor market information is analyzed and organized into, in two categories, industries and occupations. Industries are classified using a classification system called NAICS, or North American Industry Classification System, which is a production-oriented concept. This means that the classification system groups establishments into industries according to similarities in the products they produce or the services they provide. A given industry, therefore, might have employees in dozens of occupations within that industry. Occupations are also organized using a classification system that organizes workers by job duties or the tasks or the work that they show up to do every day. Employees that perform, that perform essentially the same tasks are classified in the same occupation, whether or not they work in the same industry. Some occupations are concentrated in a few particular industries, while other occupations are found across many different industries. 
Here you'll see an example of how industries are organized or coded using the NAICS system. You'll see that as we move from two to six digit codes, we get more specific about the types of establishments within the manufacturing industry. So NAICS code 311351 refers to establishments that produce or uh, follow a production process around chocolate and confectionery manufacturing from cacao beans, which is quite specific. This is an example of how we might initially use labor market information to look at industries at a regional level. Here you see we're looking at Honolulu County in Hawaii, and we've ranked the two-digit industries by job growth. We can share data about the number of jobs expected to be added over the next 10 years, there's the annu average annual salary for the industry, as well as something called the location quotient, which you see all the way on the right side of the screen. A location quotient is basically a way of quantifying how concentrated a particular industry is in a region as compared to the nation. It can reveal what makes a particular region unique in comparison to the national average. Location quotients over one indicate that the industry in this particular region is more concentrated than the national average. So for Honolulu, you see here that industries with location quotients over one, like accommodation and food services and government, are more concentrated here than they are on average nationally. Sometimes sectors that are popularly thought of as industries aren't really counted that way in the data and don't show up in the NAICS classification system. Cybersecurity is an example, as is petrochemical oil and gas, an industry that shows up often in Texas. So here you see computer science and cybersecurity are a set of a cluster of occupations that cut across industry. As mentioned earlier, occupations are also organized by a classification system called the Standard Occupational Codes, or SOC codes. Here you'll see the two-digit SOC code of 29 describes the broader family of occupations under healthcare practitioner and technical occupations. Occupations then listed underneath with the six-digit codes are occupations within this broader occupational family of healthcare practitioners and technical occupations. To analyze demand, we take expected job growth, so the number of new employees that an employer anticipates they will need to increase production. We add that to the, a number, the number of replacements, or the number an employer anticipates hiring to replace others who they think will change occupations or leave the workforce. What we then get is anticipated annual opening or the projected demand in an industry or occupation. One note here, when you see large numbers under replacements, it's often a signal that a large piece of that workforce is of retiring age. An important anchor for our labor market analysis is the regional living wage. We at JFF use the MIT living wage calculator to, save our, set, to set our baselines. You can see here the data is again for Honolulu County. At JFF, we use a standard of living wage for one adult supporting one child. We encourage our partners to do the same. We use this number for a few reasons. First, we know that many young people starting even before they enter high school have financial responsibilities outside their own and are contributing financially to their households. We also know that it can take some time for a young person to access entry-level opportunities following even completion of a pathway and that they might stay in that job for a while, even as their families grow and financial responsibilities increase. Here you'll see an example of how we might share labor market information about occupation growth in a region. We're looking at Honolulu again here and their top 10 healthcare occupations by job growth, organized by job growth. 
occupations where you see the median hourly earning in red mean that those occupations at entry level offer a living offer a wage that is below the regional living wage for one adult supporting one child. The other information we can share are around, is around the number of projected jobs to grow over the next 10 years, as well as the typical entry level education preferred for that specific occupation. A typical job posting looks something like this ad which is for a software engineer. You can get a lot of information from job postings, especially if they're good. And this one is pretty good. We have information about the company, where it's located, the job title. We also have information about the education and experience that this employer prefers for this level of software engineer. We also know what kind of work this person in this occupation will be doing when we look at the job tasks. From job ads like this, software uh, providers like Burning Glass aggregate information around skills and are able to share and analyze uh, three different categories of skills. One, technical skills, skills that are specific to that industry or occupation. Typically, someone would show up and, and utilize these skills every single day. Then there are the software skills that tend to be more specialized within specific occupations and can show competency in a specific tool or a digital skill. And then there are the employability skills, those skills that you will take from job to job from life moment to life moment uh, that are often called soft skills, 21st century skills. In, in burning glass, you'll see they're called baseline skills. For a young person engaged in college and career pathways work, there are multiple touch points along their college and career pathway journey where they can and should use labor market information to inform their decisions. Right at the beginning, they can use LMI LMI to, to inform a decision about which pathway to choose, which courses to choose within that pathway. And then as they move towards the secondary or credential attainment, they're making decisions about whether to pursue a two-year degree, a certificate, a four-year degree, and what that degree will get them in their local labor market. They're also choosing between uh, different two-year or four-year degrees or certificates as well. And then finally, as they transition into the workforce and people are making decisions about which occupation to pursue, which ent entry level opportunity to pursue based on the labor market return for them. LMI, as we hope we've shared, is, is very useful, um, but it does have its limits. Traditional LMI um, it's just projections based on past trends. And it, again, it's, cannot, it's not timely in the same way that real-time labor market information is. It also doesn't capture emerging occupations or skills or big disruptions in technology. Real-time LMI, again, is as only, only as good as the online job ads. And in order to access it, you often have to buy a license from one of the uh, proprietary software companies. So again, LMI is only the beginning. It's a slice of the data that we hope folks use when they think about designing college and career pathways. We hope it's just a slice of, of data that young people use when they make decisions about, about um, their futures. In addition to LMI, we look to local drivers, to regional economic priorities to feedback from employers in your community. We often find that it's helpful for workforce partners, for secondary, post-secondary institutions to bring labor market information to their employer community and have their partners vet it and tell them whether it shows up as true for them or not. So now we'll transition to talking about useful frameworks and considerations around equity that 
costs aren't always immediately available to us. We're just looking at the raw labor market data. The first framework or concept we want to share comes out of a study done by JFF in partnership with Burning Glass. This came out a little over a year ago. The report looks at the real economic opportunities of middle skill work. Using data from over 4 million resumes of middle skill job seekers, the report studies the career advancement prospects of people entering middle skill jobs. The opportunity framework as laid out here suggests a way of categorizing or thinking about types of occupations that offer the strongest opportunities for financial stability and true economic advancement. You can see here the three different categories and the kinds of occupations that might fall under each. For lifetime jobs, an example might be a dental hygienist. These are jobs that pay generally pretty well, offer long-term stability, but don't often offer uh, advancement opportunities. A springboard job might be an HR assistant. Um, these lead to careers where workers are advancing in different roles and they get more responsibility and greater pay within the same career field. And then static jobs, an example of which might be a medical assistant, don't typically lead to careers. They offer lower pay compared to other middle skill roles and often suffer from high turnover. Through our partnership with Burning Glass, we were able to access this very unique data source of resume data. The key metrics for this analysis looked at measuring job transitions, which measure job stability, career stability, advancement, and pay. There's a lot more to learn and interrogate about the opportunity framework, which we would encourage you to do uh, by reading the report, which is called, When is a Job Just a Job and When Can It Launch a Career? At this point, I'm gonna transition it over to my colleague, Nancy, to take us from here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna pick up from where Julia left off and talk about less tangible issues. What else to consider to help young people prepare for good careers? This slide shows uh, that uh, JFF is uh, about to publish a book called Teaching About the World of Work, A Challenge to Post-Secondary Educators. It's coming out soon and is co-edited by Michael Collins and I. It's the sixth book in our work and learning series. And uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good book to have a look at given the topics that we've just considered. This is just, this book is the sixth in the series from the Harvard Ed Press. And um, it, the work of many of you show up in some of the chapters in a variety of these publications. I'm going to quickly highlight a few chapters of particular interest in light of what Julia has been discussing. <clears throat> this chapter, perhaps the most theoretical in the book, steps way back and asks basic psychological and philosophical questions about work, not just paid work, but work in general. It also addresses loss of work, a situation we are now facing with dimensions unknown. The book, um, the, the chapter comes from a book by David Bluestein called The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty. He asks these big questions about work. These are the main assumptions that underlie the theory. Um, a word about a couple of them. <clears throat> First, that all do not have equal access to opportunity. And second, many face structural inst and institutional constraints or barriers based on who they are. I can't not mention the reason for this picture. Why did I choose it? Least valued is caregiving and demands what we call emotional labor which is expected especially of women and especially now and either free or poorly remunerated. A second chapter, which is connected to uh, what Julia was just saying about additional, additional factors um, like the way careers are developed is called what makes a good job. 
This chapter recaps the research and practice of the Good Jobs Institute affiliated with MIT and developed by the work of Zainab Tan, who teaches there. It tells why salary and benefits are only a foundation for good jobs. A good job uh, is more than salary and benefits. It offers a schedule that fits workers' lives, a path to more responsibility and earnings, and the conditions for learning, engagement, and productivity. The Good Jobs Institute helps companies thrive by creating jobs that help workers both make a living and build a career. The Good Jobs Institute created this employee pyramid to capture the various elements that comprise a good job, including both basic and higher human needs. These factors are rooted in, acad in the academic literature on human motivation and work design. The final chapter I'll mention is one of several here that address lack of equity and its impact on those seeking work and those already in the workplace. <clears throat> you may recognize the name of one of the authors here, JFF's own Gregory Seaton. This first slide makes a distinction between obstacles that you can jump over if you see what they are and know how to address them versus barriers that discriminate and exclude and are built into the system and into institutions. Barriers may be hidden or indecipherable, which makes them more destructive. In fact, barriers based on race and ethnicity are often hidden in, la in language such as, she doesn't have the right skills for this job or he doesn't fit. Adults need to help young people identify and understand barriers so that they can address them and take action. Also important, this chapter addresses helping young people combat internalizing the results of structural and institutional barriers. Barriers. I didn't get the job because there's something wrong with me, rather than I didn't get the job because the hiring manager made the snap judgment based on what I look like. Here are two quotes from the Gates Foundation Equitable Futures Initiative. Both of these people, for various reasons, might benefit from a deep understanding of the causes of these feelings rather than internalizing them. The first is a young black male, lower income in New York City, who says, I feel like there will be like people who try to hold you back, but like at the end of the day, you still got to put in that work. Yeah, he's white, he's probably gonna get the job before you, but what are you gonna do about it? Like, are you going, okay, I'm not gonna do it? You have gotta work harder. I think you definitely gotta work harder as a black man or woman in general, just to get your spot because that's just the way it is. And the second one is the kind of uh, statement that we hear all the time in the work we do and a statement that really breaks people's hearts. This is a mother talking to her children don't be like me, do something better. My back hurts, I'm tired. A, B, and C happened today. You guys have so much potential, you have to do better. Maybe they get to stay home. I have to cut expenses for you to do better than this. So you are free not to work so hard. Even though I see myself as fairly successful for someone who didn't go to college, I'm like you guys. Don't be like me. Finally, I'm going to turn to uh, the questions um, about appropriate supports to put in place to help young people be able to cope with the inevitable racism and sexism that they will encounter if they're young people of color or low income. Some of these supports are already built into pathways building. Perhaps most common would be early career exploration and counseling supports addressing the aspirations gap and helping young people imagine their futures. But others on this list are difficult to address and often aren't even acknowledged. A body of knowledge, for example, confirms the impact on the health and well-being of people who are stressed at work, especially when it's caused by other people's views of a worker's acceptability and ability. Thus, we should ask, are students learning how to self-manage and get support including from more privileged peers. 
And finally, are students learning about the importance of professional networks and getting help actually ac accessing a network that will lead them to new job opportunities and careers? Thanks very much for listening, and now we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions.